must be destroyed on sight. Welcome to They Must Be Destroyed on Site, a movie podcast. Uh, I'm Lee Russell, here with my uh, co-host, Daniel Harper. How's it going, Dan? Just as well as it was 10 minutes ago. Ah, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing. We're trying to knock off some episodes here, back to back, uh, so we can try to keep this thing going weekly, so we always have something in the can. Um, because whenever it... I talk to Lee, he likes it when I put things in the can. Exactly. Um, but don't bump. Uh, I'm I just should, here to I tell should... jokes, that's it. I should find I should find a rim shot soundtrack uh, sound bite to put in there. Yeah. Mm. But uh, yeah, we're going to be doing um, yet another one of these uh, lazy top five uh, <laughs> lists uh, because we enjoy doing them and it's our podcast. So fuck you. And um, I've just been too busy to actually watch the movie he asked me to watch uh, yet. So mm. you know, it's it's uh, completely my fault that we're doing the the lazy ones. But you know, well, well. Also, to be fair, um, the movie I suggested that we're uh, going to do here down the line is one that I found I've needed constant <laughs> rewatchings to to get everything out of it that I hope to get out of it so uh it's it's sort of a work in progress anyway from both of us so yes mm. but um and we're both now drinking which is always a good sign yeah uh i well i've been drinking well before this uh podcast star i think you were too uh I, i'm pretty sure i saw you on untapped uh <laughs> well i i've had one beer so far tonight so i'm not uh you know for me that's not really drinking but you know yeah um, I've had three so far, um, and they're all seven percent, all seven percent. Um, but yeah, um, uh, again, we're doing another top five list, uh, this time not top five movies of some genre, but we're going to be focusing on soundtracks and or scores for films. Um, this is one I suggested, uh, something that I sort of, you know, strikes a chord with me quite a bit is uh, a really great soundtrack or a really great score uh, can sometimes almost make or break a film. Uh, although I, I haven't picked any films where they were made or broken by the score. Um, just, just ones from films I love uh, that just made the films so much better. Um, so uh, again, we're going to be doing this uh, Siskel and Ebert uh, sort of thing where we each count down our list, taking turns. And um, I will start this time. Sure. And, and um, my number five is going to be from uh, Werner Herzog's remake of Nosferatu, uh, 1979. Um, it is a soundtrack done by a group that he's uh, done work with before, uh, Papa Vu. Um, I've... I forget at the moment what that means. I know it has something to do with uh, uh, one of the uh, South American religions, uh, but um, they're they're a German group. Um, they do very uh, slightly psychedelic progressive rock um, with a lot of uh, East Indian, uh, Asian, and South American sort of uh, instruments and musical structures put into their uh, stuff. Uh, I found this soundtrack really, um, it, it really brought a, a great deal of atmosphere to the film uh, that wouldn't have been there otherwise if it just had like a typical sort of horror movie soundtrack or uh, orchestral romantic almost kind of soundtrack that you'd sometimes see in like um, these sort of horror films. Um, I just really like it because it's very unique and weird, uh, like there's a lot of sitar and things like that, and some of these songs uh, gives you the feeling that it maybe plays back to uh, musical styles that were first becoming born, um, and that uh, Klaus Kinski's Dracula character might have been around as a vampire even back then, when some of these things were just starting, starting to germinate and uh, come to fruition. Um, but also... 
outside of the really moody uh, Papa Vool stuff, um, and a lot of it was actually, I think some of it was original compositions made for the film, but a lot of it was actually taking from a previous album of theirs and just repackaged as a soundtrack album. Uh, but there's also some other pieces of music in this film. Uh, there's uh, Richard Wagner's uh, Prelude to Das Rheingold, um, which is an amazing piece of music. Uh, there's Charles uh, Gounod's uh, Sanctus. And the most striking piece is uh, uh, a rendition of, and I'm probably going to pronounce this totally incorrectly, uh, Zincaro, which is a uh, uh, Georgian folk tune done by the vocal ensemble Gordelia, I believe. Um, there's this scene in that film uh, where the main heroine of the film uh, is walking to the street to the town that has been ravaged by uh, the Black Plague, uh, brought on by the arrival of Dracula. And that plays over all the madness that's going on because the survivors of the, of the uh, plague, the ones who basically haven't died yet, are celebrating, basically gone half mad, eating their last suppers while just this big horde of rats are running around their feet, scurrying around. Really, really effective. One of my favorite scenes I've ever seen in a horror film. Um, still sticks with me uh, every time. And, uh, yeah, that, that soundtrack is just fucking amazing. It's one I listen to all the time. It's like it's something I constantly have in rotation in my uh, uh, CD player and on my MP3 player when I'm at work. Uh, it, it can just, you know, take me right out of uh, the tedium of everyday shit and kill time. So, uh, wonderful soundtrack. Yeah, it sounds awesome. I actually have not seen the uh, uh, Werner Herzog uh, Nosferatu. Um, I've seen the original, but I haven't seen that version, and so I don't know that soundtrack. But uh, I'm sure it's amazing. So, uh, th- you know, again, I keep saying this; it's on my list. I just got to get around <laughs> to. It. Yeah. Uh, come on, you know, life is only so long. But uh, yeah, no, yeah. that's definitely gonna happen. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I don't know. Don't have anything else to say. I haven't heard it, but uh, looking forward to it. Uh, my number five, and these are not in any particular order, but, um, I actually, um, I did kind of try to go for stuff that I've listened to a lot, so it's gonna, some of it, you know, it's all kind of from the same general time release, um, Mm -hmm. you know, movies that, that I kind of fell in love with in my, you know, late teens and early twenties, basically, um, and, uh, just that I've listened to the soundtrack a bunch, so, um, you know. Uh, I feel like these are very personal choices, and I don't claim to be a uh, a musical genius or anything like that. But um, Mm -hmm. I did want to include at least one that's just kind of like, look at how much fun this is, and look at how much uh, great music, uh, you know, how the music really informs the uh, the fabric of the film. And that is from Guy Ritchie's 2000 film, Snatch. Uh Yeah. Lots of it's kind of funny. Like there's not even like there's that one kind of particular uh, uh, riff, uh, you know, this kind of uh, almost pipe organ kind of thing that you can kind of think of when you when you think of that film. And then there's mm-hmm. a bunch of uh, kind of electronic music, a bunch of uh, you know, kind of uh, Euro trash pop uh, sort of stuff. Um, I think. So. Yeah, there's a. St- there's a Stranglers tune on there, a British punk band, uh, Golden Brown. Yeah, no, there, there's a ton of stuff on this. Um, I actually have the, the uh, list in front of me right now. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm just, I'm, mm. I'm making myself not hit play just while I'm, uh, because obviously I couldn't do that while I'm doing be on the podcast. But uh, it's a really, really fun um, soundtrack. Uh, it's great driving music. It's great, you know, just kind of working on something kind of music. Uh, definitely worth mm-hmm. uh, checking out if you uh, are in uh, the mood to do so. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that actually is a really good soundtrack. Um, my brother, who's less of a musically inclined person than I am, you know, he's he's not as uh, a person who always gotta, has to listen to music. Uh, I am sort of one of those people who always has to listen to music at some point. Um he bought the soundtrack to that. He loved it so yep. much. Like that's one. Of his, that's one of his favorite movies. Um, 
and yeah, it, it it really is a good soundtrack. It, it's it's very it's quite varied. Uh, uh, it's quite quirky, and the movie itself is quite quirky as well. So it, it fits very well tonally with the whole thing. Yep. And uh, yeah, yeah, really good, and probably one of Guy Ritchie's uh, best uh, films. I so. I think it is my favorite Guy Ritchie film, actually. Um, yeah, I, I do like it better than Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. So, me too, actually. Yeah. So yeah, uh, your next choice. Okay. Yeah, so my number four would be um, John Milius's uh, uh, Conan the Barbarian from 1982, <laughs> the soundtrack. What do you like? I'm just, I, I think it's awesome. Yeah, uh, it, the soundtrack was done by uh, Basil uh, Pod- Poldaris. I think I'm saying his name correctly. Uh, I've seen like three or four different pronunciations of his name, but um, fantastic. Uh, uh, score in it's it's sort of it's orchestral but it doesn't sound contrived and it doesn't sound kind of bland like I find a lot of orchestral soundtracks to sound like every piece of music in it is distinct uh, but at the same time it it does like any good soundtrack or score actually uh, correct myself there uh, it has sort of a underlying uh, melody or theme sort of connecting a lot of the pieces so there's a really good uh, continued flow of mood and tone throughout the entire thing um, uh, Milius sort of turned the Conan character uh, far more German- Germanic in the film as opposed to Celtic um, uh, so uh, there's more of a Teutonic Viking sort of f- feel to the film uh i think i think the score uh really sort of uh bolsters that and it's actually one of the best things about that film uh, i do like the film a lot but uh the score really does help elevate the film quite a bit and um even though uh i'll say this uh conan the barbarian is not my conan that i love from the books it's still the best conan movie out there and uh the score is a big part of that so really good stuff yeah no um that is a really i think that's a really underrated movie and uh yeah i I, i'm having a hard time like recalling the score but um yeah no i i definitely agree it's it's got some uh some great music in it hmm (laughs) <laughs> all right um my next one and i've kind of made the list of five and i'm kind of picking them you know so uh again these are kind of no mm-hmm. particular order um another one that i kind of rediscovered recently actually um because i saw the movie again after a long time um and yeah. that is fight club uh this oh, yeah. is a, a score from the dust brothers um mm. it's uh an, and then uh it's got the one pixie song where's my mind at the end which is uh absolutely worth yeah. uh you know worth the price of admission by itself but uh no the um this electronic score composed specifically for the movie um very much uh fits that uh you know again it integrates into the fabric of the film in such a way that like it's hard to separate one from the other but um if you know, I found myself uh, before I saw the movie again, um, just uh, you know, I pulled up the score on YouTube. The you know, somebody has uploaded the whole thing, and I just started listening to it. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing, like how quickly I got like back into that groove, and suddenly like it's in my head for a couple of days, just listening to it, you know, yeah. for an hour. Um, really great score. Um, uh, you know, fits the film very unique. Uh, and uh, I just love it. I, I do. Um, I, I wish that the Dust Brothers had done more um, movie scores, and I don't think that they really have. So, too bad. Yeah, um, that's funny. I'm gonna have to watch Fight Club again here pretty soon because honestly, I outside of actually that that Pixies song, I don't recall the music in in Fight Club at all. Uh, I, I remember it was you know it was Dust Brothers, and it was you know scored specifically for the film. Um, so yeah, I'm going to have to revisit it because it, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, fire off any, uh, neurons in my stupid brain. <laughs> hey, you know, it happens. Um, it's really one of those, I, yeah. it, if I had not seen the film again so recently, it wouldn't have kind of immediately jumped to my mind, but because I had, mm-hmm. and because I had listened to the soundtrack again, uh, I, you know, it's, it's one of those like instant, like it, it just per- perched me right up. Um, so uh, definitely, again, uh, you can you can actually listen to the whole uh, score on YouTube. 
Uh, if you just look for yeah. Fight Club soundtrack, um, you know, until somebody takes it down, uh, you can go check that out. Hmm. Um, and I would, I mean, I'd absolutely recommend uh, checking that out um, whenever you get a chance. Right on. Okay, uh, we'll jump right to my number three here. Um, this is John Carpenter's uh, score for Halloween. Oh, God. Uh, 1978. Yep. You know that's that's all you gotta say. Done. You know, <laughs> uh, it's it is it is the epitome of uh, a tonally consistent score where um, there is a main melody basically going through two or three different songs, and there and it's essentially changed up a little bit for the different pieces. Uh, it's you know it's either made a little louder, sped up a little, or slowed down a little, depending on the um, scene that the movie's showing. But uh, it's a brilliant score. John Carpenter, um, people go, if, the, if they talk about his musical ability, oh, they go, oh, he's the great soundtrack guy. No, he's actually a great composer as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, the score is very minimalistic, um, electronic uh, or synth basically mixed with piano, and that's the entire thing. Um, fantastic. Builds the mood, um, builds the dread. Uh, just really iconic, sticks in your head uh, without a doubt. Uh, he changed it up a bit for part two. Uh, and actually some very unique pa- changes in that one as well. Although it's essentially the same score, he just, you know, just changed it up, maybe put an extra instrument in there somewhere for some of the pieces, and it, it changed uh, the mood and the tone again for that film. Um, really, really awesome. Just uh, really a, a master work in simple minimalist uh, score, and um, it was sort of a trademark of his throughout most of his films where almost everything he did was sort of in that minimalist uh tone and for all of his films it ended up working out very well as far as i'm concerned yeah, no, so. uh, john carpenter uh definitely has a uh a sound you know this this kind of uh general kind of idea that you can uh associate with uh so many of his films um where he yeah did you did did you see that he's uh, releasing an album in February? I did not know that. I uh, will have to check that out. He, he he's releasing an album called Lost Themes, and basically what it is is he's um, wrote a bunch of pieces of music that uh, sort of are inspired by his films that would have maybe been in his films. Uh, so it's not like lost tracks that he previously wrote. It's like all new stuff. Apparently, uh, you can actually find like the uh, one of the tracks off it is a preview on SoundCloud and stuff like that. Really, really good. Uh, I'm really excited. I'm I actually pre-ordered it. So <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty awesome. No, um, if I may, uh, if I may uh, take a little aside here, um, take a few okay. minutes of your time and the audience's time. Um, I actually just got back from a uh, Doctor Who convention last weekend, mm-hmm. and uh, one of the composers for the classic series, a guy named Dominic Glenn. Uh, was mm-hmm. um, there, and uh, he did a. Uh, he's the guy. If you're if you're at all a Doctor Who fan, he actually wrote the uh, the kind of what's known as the Sixth Doctor theme, um, which is the very yeah. synth heavy one. Um, he was kind of hired yeah. at that yeah. time period. Um, now he's kind of an in demand composer. Um, he actually kind of does a lot of uh, uh, music for films. He's done a lot of kind of stuff in England. He's also a um, kind of a uh, a, uh, a guy who kind of writes music and then licenses it for films is kind of generic background music. So um, he's yeah. kind of built a career out of being a, a, a film composer. Um, but it's funny how much of like, you know, we kind of think of the stuff from that era and, uh, you know, maybe unfair. I'm not trying to, to tar Carpenter with this brush, but uh, it's kind of a electronic-y, synthy kind of stuff. And we kind of think, oh, it just sounds really dated. But, you know, at the time that was like cutting edge stuff. And, uh, mm-hmm. um, he actually gave a, uh, Dominic Glenn, um, who was a sweet, sweet guy, I actually exchanged a couple of words with him, um, which was cool. Um, but he kind of gave a, a concert, uh, the, the Friday night, 
um, you know, just kind of doing riffs on his old scores for the show, which was uh, kind really? of awesome. So you're like, oh my god, it's the Mysterious Planet thing, only it's different. Um, it's <laughs> a very, very cool and uh, just a very, very self-effacing guy. Anyway, um, that, I just wanted to kind of throw that in there since we're talking about music and, and scores and stuff. That um, Oh yeah, no, that's, that's yeah. great. I, I, I love the music from uh, Classic Who. Like, yeah. Um, uh, you and you, you can find all the scores on YouTube. Like there, there's people who have playlists of just like, or just actually just in a single fucking video where they got every, every opening score for uh, every doctor. Right. Yep. Um, I will sit and listen to those sometimes when I'm uh, just needing something to, to put on that I just love, you know? So um, anyway, that's, that's a complete aside it has nothing to do with uh, anything on the rest of this podcast, but uh, did want to, Oh no, 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 that was good. Um, is it my turn or yours? It is your turn. Okay. Um, once again, we're going to name uh, something that uh, a classic, something that is, uh, you know, uh, I tried to limit myself to one soundtrack per filmmaker. Um, and that's going to become mm-hmm. even more clear uh, with my next choice, but uh, Pulp Fiction. Um, yeah, okay. You know, uh, everybody kind of thinks of, you know, the, uh, you know, this is... Everybody thinks of that kind of opening theme song, you know, the uh, the Miserloo, mm-hmm. um, the the guitar yep. bit, the the uh, kind of surf guitar. But yep. uh, you know, it's also got just a great uh, soundtrack backing that up. Uh, I think Tarantino, one of his great talents is uh, using uh, film scores uh, to to layer in uh, things in the world, and uh, you yep. saw that in Reservoir Dogs. I mean, you know, people kind of talk about. You can't listen to Stuck in the Middle with you and not think about cutting a guy's ear off at this point, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's just the reality of the situation. And uh, I think uh, Pulp Fiction is really one of those uh, soundtracks that I can uh, put on and just listen to. And uh, it just puts me right back into the movie, um, even though so much of it is, you know, it's not original to the movie. It's, you know, it's his own thing. But um, he really makes uh, his soundtracks his own. Um and uh, Pulp Fiction is just sort of one of those obvious choices for me. I just had to, like, throw it in there. Yeah, no, that's that's good. Um, actually, I'm actually incredibly surprised that I didn't include him on my list at all. Um, because when I when I do think about it, like, he, although he's not a composer, he has an amazing talent for uh, putting together, like, a really good soundtrack for his films. And, and he does take older pieces of music that were used in a different way and he manages to retool them to fit the mood and the tone of his films and his characters and uh but i mean that comes from the like i some people it's it's cool to shit on tarantino oh look at this asshole or whatever you know um but he really is a talented uh director he is an incredibly talented guy as far as just knowing and feeling film as far as i'm concerned like he has a you know his his deep knowledge of of films uh comes out in basically everything he does um and yeah uh uh pulp fiction is a great one um jackie brown is the other like you know jackie yeah jackie brown's probably the one i would i would cite as uh one of the really great examples of him uh that and also uh I'd say uh, when he uses uh, Morricone stuff in uh, in Inglorious Bastards, uh, where where he almost turns it into a spaghetti western in some points. Um, and and the funny thing is, uh, uh, Morricone um, didn't like having his music used in uh, his latest film, there, uh, Django Unchained. He he felt uh, Tarantino. Uh, was not using his music properly, wow. which is which is kind of interesting. I, ha- I haven't heard <laughs> that. I'll have to go look that up. Um, but we're going to yeah. talk about Morricone later. Uh, hint, hint. Mm. Yeah. Uh, not even later. Oh. Uh, my number two pick, <laughs> Once Upon a Time in the oh. West from uh, Why don't Morricone. we just, that, that's, also, that's also my next choice, so. Oh, okay, great. Um, because this is, I think... Uh, the gold standard of using music to uh, basically connecting music to characters um, uh, out, outside of just the, the amazing uh, pieces of the score that uh, just sort of uh, take the narrative along. 
there there are the individual scores for the principal characters that keep popping up uh intermixing when the characters intermix um absolutely fucking fantastic it's the kind of thing that just gives you goosebumps when you're when you're watching this like when you get to the final showdown with bronson uh <laughs> it's it's fucking amazing where where harmonica and uh frank's scores meld together in their final showdown yeah. Um, and, uh, there's, there's, and I think this is probably the best example of Morricone, uh, in Spaghetti Westerns, as much as I love The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, I think it works better here. Once um, upon a time, time in the West is the epic. Like, that's the, you know, yeah. we're gonna do Lawrence of Arabia, but we're gonna do it in, you know, um, in a Spaghetti Western. Uh, sorry. I, I cannot say enough amazing things about uh, Morricone's scores. Uh, I am um, such a uh, such a fan, uh, particularly this one. I have listened to this many, many, many times. Um, I actually downloaded the you know I um, illegally downloaded the uh, the score on a torrent site years ago, and so it's yeah. all in Italian. I don't even know what any of them are called because they're all just random strings of vowels to me. Um, but, uh, I will, um, uh, I will sit and listen to them. I will sit and listen to this whole score consecutively, um, many times. Um, and there are uh, just some, some great, great music in this. Um, uh, and yeah, the film is yeah. underrated too. I think, I think people don't, I think a lot of people don't realize how good this movie is. That's another one that was chopped apart before it came over here. Um, and, uh, people, you know, they didn't understand it cause there was a lot cut out of it. I mean, it's an incredibly f- long film it's like two and a half hours uh almost three hours and you need to watch the in, that entire running time to actually get the film in its proper way um but yeah the the score is just so <laughs> fucking amazing um just just the way again how it connects to the characters uh, it informs you when the characters are showing up what what it's what they're doing oh excuse me how they're interacting um and it it tells you the characters' backstories in a way without them having to tell you in exposition and things like that. Like you get a feel for what they are, who they are, what they're about. Um, and I uh, and it was funny because I think I think uh, he wrote the score before um, more uh, before uh, Leone. Uh, directed the film that way he could direct the film around the score and 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 put the performances uh in tune with the actual score so um really really cool uh i could go into a bit more detail about uh once upon the time the west but this isn't a movie review uh episode for the podcast so i'll cut it off at that yeah no <laughs> definitely uh once upon a time in the west definitely worth your time and uh, i think you and i are gonna have to i'm gonna have to rewatch it we're gonna have to uh, talk about that in some detail yeah. uh, fairly shortly because uh, i do really love that film um, and i think yeah. not enough people have seen it so okay so since that was both our number yeah. two <laughs> should, should should i go next or do you want to go next? yeah we'll, we'll let you do your sure. number one um and um just another I uh, decided not to use multiple scores by the same filmmaker, even when the filmmaker used different uh, people writing the scores. Uh, this is a score, um, the reason, it's not even like number one, but this is probably the thing I've listened to most often over the last few years. Um, and that is uh, the both the score and the soundtrack to uh, Magnolia from Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, yeah. the Amy Mann soundtrack is what people really like paid attention to when the movie was released. Um, because mm-hmm. you know, it's got save me, it's got wise up, it's got, you know, um, a bunch of really great songs and I've listened to that many times, but the John Bryan score I think is even better. Um, it's got some really great kind of, uh, emotional bits. It's got this like kind of driving, um, Baseline, these kind of like strong uh, violins through uh, a bunch in the middle of it um, that really tie this uh, very long um, kind of uh, mini stories in one movie kind of thing. It really ties yeah. it together sonically in a lot of ways, and it keeps you on board with where you are emotionally, even if you don't know where you are um, 
in the actual plot lines of these different stories. Okay. So um, I actually really love that movie. Um, it's actually kind of one of those, like, I just love the movie um, to bits. Uh, but the score, I will sit and listen to the score um, any day. <laughs> I just, I love it. Um, cool. Yeah, I've only seen that movie once. So yeah. I'm going to have to watch it again because the score doesn't, doesn't pop up in my head at all. Yeah, so, uh, but I I did really like the film when I watched it. Yeah, no, um, definitely worth checking that out at some point. Um, again, check out the Amy because the Amy Man uh, soundtrack is is kind of easy to get a hold of these days. But uh, you, yeah. you kind of have to search a little bit harder. Not even really that much harder, but you have to search a little bit harder for the John Bryan score. Um, John Bryan's a super super talented guy. He's done a lot of film soundtracks, and if we kind of go into are also Rands. I will talk a lot about John Bryan, I think, um, because I, I really right. love his uh, his scores. So, Cool. Okay, and uh, so I'll go to my number one. Um, this is Dawn of the Dead, 1978. Um, depending on what version you watch of this film, uh, it's a combination of library tracks selected by George Romero and uh, tracks from Goblin, which was uh, a band, still a band, actually. Yeah, I think they just toured the U.S. for the first time this year. Um, but they were uh, associated with uh, Dario Argento, who had a lot to do with Dawn of the Dead actually being made and actually had uh, the rights to basically recut and release it in Europe. Um, and so if you have the... Uh, if you have the uh, Ultimate Edition uh, DVD set uh, of Dawn of the Dead, you can see the European version of the film, and you can see the uh, con uh, version that is basically uncut for, for the most part, um, and you can see the theatrical uh, edition as well um, for the U.S. And uh, you listen to all three different versions, and uh, the scores vary quite a bit. Uh, just because of the music selections between all three uh, films. Um, and I love it. I love the sort of the, the pulsating uh, electronic cold kind of uh, drive that a lot of the tracks in it have um, where, you know, it's just, it just sort of uh, makes it feel like it's like, yeah, those, those zombies are driving ever forward. Uh, you can also associate with a, with a heartbeat. Um, works very very well uh there's all kinds of awesome incidental uh music uh there's about a million versions of soundtracks for this film out there you can find all kinds of like incidental dawn of the dead and then the, like the official goblin score and shit like that um i love of course uh if anyone's been you know you listen to this podcast you'll you'll have heard the gonk uh at the beginning of the of the podcast um which I, I really like that, too. Uh, just sticks right in your head. Um, and it's one of my favorite films of all time, and I think the soundtrack, it's a, just a perfect marriage of uh, soundtrack, library tracks, and uh, film. I think it works very well. And I'm at this point where I really love uh, that film, and I mm. believe you completely. And uh, I'm kind of in that place where you were the Fight Club, where I just I don't have a score in my head when I think of that movie. But yeah. uh, you know, I'll check that out. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's the thing. This, like I said, this one there's there's so many versions of the soundtrack out there, and um, there's there's no real clear. I don't I don't know if there's an ultimate collected version or not of everything that was on every cut of the film, because the European cut is quite a bit different you know, there's a lot of different musical parts like the european film is vastly trimmed down um a lot more action scenes in that one than uh in the u.s cut um and so there's a lot more like uh sort of generic library uh rock music stuck into it uh sort of really fast action tracks and stuff like that um but yeah it's really it's really cool it's like i i, I did a marathon watching of all three films uh, a couple years ago all three versions of the film and it was like you know it, it just stuck out to me it's like holy shit it, the soundtrack's oh, excuse me vastly different and it changes the tone of the film between all three like 
So, uh, re- really, really cool. Yeah, it, I like it. It's it's kind of a, a lesson in how a uh, how the change in a soundtrack, how the change in score mm-hmm. can affect the way you view a a film. Um, yeah. You know, like you know the the uh, uh, again to kind of go back, Dominic Glenn uh, was often uh, the the Doctor Who uh, uh, composer. You know, he said. In mm-hmm. his career, a lot of times, particularly with Doctor Who, because they just they didn't have the money and they ran out of time, and they basically were he'd be handed something and say, "Can you fix this?" You know, um, <laughs> can you know? And it's like, well, I can try. Um, so many times, you know, composers are brought in to do exactly that to to say, you know, well, um, we need this to be scary. Can you make it scary by putting the right piece of music on it? And, and a good composer can can do a lot of a lot of good work. Um, yeah. It's also, you know, as long as we're talking about composers and, and, and film music, you know, it's um, interesting that uh, in many cases a composer is kind of the last person to get to leave his or her mark on a film. Um, yeah. You know, it's kind of the last thing that gets done. It's after production. It's, you know, kind of the editing is, is mostly locked in place. And then a composer is brought in to kind of um, – make the movie into what it is. And so uh, I think that's why movie scores speak to us in such a, such a compelling way um, because they can uh, really transform the way that we think about a film. Yeah, I agree. Um, I do have some uh, uh, honorable mentions here. Uh, do you have any in mind that you'd like I, to I to absolutely do. And that is um, I was uh, kind of devastated with myself that I could not put a Philip Glass score on this list. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. and really the reason was that they are, you know, there's not one, you know, like you, 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 <laughs> um, uh, Mishima is probably the one that I've listened to the most. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but Philip Glass scores get used kind of all over the place. Um, my wife was actually listening to, I think, uh, th- there's a, there's a bit of, uh, one of his scores cause they also get recycled a bit, but there's a bit of one of his scores that was used in the Watchmen film. And uh, oh, yeah. I kind of came my I kind of came to pick up my wife earlier uh, to go home, you know, to from campus, and she was uh, listening to that, and I'm like, "Yep, no, that's great, that's awesome." I, and she's not yeah. usually one to like sit and listen to, oh yes, depressing Philip Glass music, but uh, you know, um, I, I was like, "Oh yeah, I need to I need to go listen to that at some point, you know, later on." Um, great, uh, great score. So just anything by Philip Glass, I'm I'm there. Um, cool. Uh, also John Bryan, I do, uh, I mentioned John Bryan earlier with the Magnolia score. Um, mm-hmm. also the Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, um, has oh, yeah, a, yeah. a phenomenal score, um, and a, a bunch of good pop songs on that. Um, so, uh, check that one out. Um, that's a, you know, again, a phenomenal movie, um, which also in our last episode would have fit, um, very nicely into the great science fiction films, um, mm. conversation just now that I'm thinking of it, but, uh, truly phenomenal <laughs> score. Um, absolutely worth your time. Uh, and I've yeah. got more, but you should go next. All right. Um, not necessarily soundtracks altogether, but I would, I, I would be, um, I'd be a, a dick if I didn't mention like Hans Zimmer, oh, yeah. uh, a, a lot of, a lot of his pieces. Uh, I especially loved the one he used, uh, used for, uh, Badlands, um, the Charlie Sheen, um, Sissy Spacek film from, I think, 1973 or four or something like that. Um, great. It, it's just got like, uh, I guess he uses uh, what, a, a, a fucking xylophone or whatever the hell you call that shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but, but it sounds like kind of tropical and, uh, and sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh fun and upbeat when it's a story about uh two young people going around shooting people you know uh um but the thing about that is i love how it was uh sort of redone and used for true romance uh the tony scott film that uh quentin tarantino wrote um uh absolutely i love that theme sticks in my brain all the time uh true romance is one of my favorite movies uh of all time it's a great movie yeah, um, but just so good. Um, but uh, as far as uh, full-on soundtracks and scores, uh, Superfly from 1972 by uh, Curtis Mayfield. 
absolutely great. One of the quintessential uh, black exploitation soundtracks. Uh, it's got Curtis Mayfield's "Pusher Man" on there, which is a great song. Um, you probably could not that that film. Uh, like I said on my official list, I wasn't gonna put films on there that uh, would have been hurt if they didn't, you know, uh, have that 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 soundtrack, you know, if, but, uh, Superfly, I think it definitely benefits even more from having Curtis Mayfield doing the soundtrack. I think it really elevates the film quite a bit. Um, uh, another one, um, a film I definitely want to review at some point, Black Dynamite from 2009, Adrian Young, uh, did the soundtrack for that, the score for it. Um, Fantastic! It just uh, as Black Dynamite is like a perfect recreation of black exploitation films. He did a perfect recreation of black exploitation soundtracks, where uh, but but not a black exploitation soundtrack from a good black exploitation film. It, it's a it's a it's a it's a recreation of a really bad black exploitation film soundtrack. That sounds awesome. Where yeah, where. Where the soundtrack would uh, at times be describing exactly what's going on in the film. <laughs> yeah, where, like there's there, yeah there's one song like Jimmy's apartment where Black Dynamite is in, is in his brother's Jimmy's apartment and it's describing exactly what's going on in the apartment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's it's awesome. Adrian Young is an incredibly talented uh, dude, by the way. Like even like I would. I would uh, encourage people to seek out his uh, stuff outside of the Black Dynamite uh, soundtrack as well, because he's just really great. Um, another one I'd uh, mention, um, the soundtrack from Drive from uh, 2011. Uh, it's There is a lot of uh, basically just score stuff from Cliff uh, Martinez, but there's also like some really, uh, really good sort of uh, synth uh, pop uh, groups in that. Uh, uh, Kavinsky is one of them. Um, I, I love I love that film. I love uh, the way the soundtrack uh, sort of almost makes you think the film is set in like a world where the 1980s never stopped happening. <laughs> um, really, really good. Uh, it's it's in constant rotation on my MP3 player. I always listen to it. I, I love it. Uh, uh, like the song uh, "Real Hero," uh, I listen to that all the time. And I, I usually don't listen to uh, sort of synth pop and electronica stuff, but uh, something about uh, that soundtrack really stuck with me, and I love the stuff when on I it. When I think um, of you, I think 80s dance pop, you know, like oh, yeah, bubblegum yeah. 80s pop. That's really what I think of. Think <laughs> um, uh, if, I could, if I could list a couple more, um, yep. Requiem for a Dream, the uh, Kronos mm-hmm. Quartet stuff. Um, oh, yeah. Really, really great. Um, they didn't write the score. Forget the guy who wrote the score. Um, but uh, there's a, a piece of music that, like, when you've seen Requiem for a Dream, it's just like, oh, that's the Requiem for a Dream music. Um, and, yeah. uh, you know, it's uh, really, really phenomenal. Really driving, you know, that kind of, um, you know, very harsh, strong uh, string instruments. Um, really worth checking out. Um, mm-hmm. That one is on YouTube. You can actually see a live performance of that on YouTube. So uh, that's that's oh, really? worth checking out. Cool. Um, uh, another one that uh, you know um, we haven't talked about John Williams or you know some of those guys, but you know, obviously you know kind of the John Williams, yeah. uh, Indiana Jones and, and Star Wars. Um, one of the uh, uh, really nice things is that we are kind of speaking when the uh, new Star Wars teaser trailer has just been released and there's new John Williams yeah. Star Wars movie music in that. Oh, really? Um, really? Yeah, cool. no, if you watch that trailer, it's got, I mean, you know, it's not a lot of music, but it's actually brand new John Williams Star Wars music. And, uh, hmm. you know, he still got it. You know, there's no, no question about that. Um, you know, when John Williams gives a shit, uh, there's some good shit happening. Um, yeah. another one that maybe we won't think of, um, a movie that I really love that I don't know how you feel about, but, uh, the, uh, first How to Train Your Dragon film, um, has... Never seen it. <laughs> um, I actually really love that film. Um, but the, uh, the, uh, movie has a score by John Powell. Um, and it is, you know, kind of a fairly traditional movie score, but, uh, really, mm. really nice stuff. Like, um... Uh, really uh, emotionally moving, really fits the film very well. 
Um, in that film, uh, you know, people kind of talk about how great the flying sequences are, and it's kind of talk about how how the comedy is and all the cheesy stuff. But um, it's mm-hmm. much much better than its reputation uh, among uh, people who haven't seen it. You know, it looks like it's much much worse than it is. It's actually a really good movie, so um, I'd recommend mm-hmm. that. Um, and uh, one more while I'm thinking about it, and we'll, don't forget it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Oh, yeah. Um, and that's another one of those, uh, it's not a score, I mean, it's a, uh, there's a lot of original music actually written by Beck for the film, um, yeah. and then there's, a you know, some other stuff that's kind of going on, um, that music, I will actually sit and listen to that soundtrack, uh, just while doing other stuff, um, and not, and, and it's just one of those that I just put on rotation, um, and just listen to I really, I really do like Beck, um, he's, he's incredibly underrated, like, I think people give him a lot of slack for being a sort of a dopey Scientologist or whatever, but um, but uh, I think he's actually one of the better uh, modern artists uh, in the last twenty years or so. Like he, like a lot of his albums are fucking fantastic, as far as I'm concerned. Like a lot of people pigeonhole him as oh he's just another uh, guy from the grunge era or whatever. But those people never listen to his fucking albums, as far as I'm concerned. Right. They, they might have they might have saw Loser. And that's well, about Loser, it. Loser uh, is like literally like 21 years ago now. You know, yeah. um, uh. he's he's done a lot since then. Um, and I yeah. love Loser, so I'm not. I'm you know, Mellow Gold is a great album. I'm not gonna you know. Oh but, yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, and so is Odele, but uh, you know, yep. then he went on and he did a bunch of other great albums that sound very different. Well, he well, you know? mentioned you mentioned uh, uh, Eternal Sunshine. Uh, uh, he has a track on that one too. Oh, that's right, he does. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, cool. Uh, the only other one I had on my, uh, on my list, uh, was the score for lost in translation from 2003, uh, uh, Bill Murray. Um, the, it was, there's various artists on it. Uh, I think there's a couple songs from, uh, Kevin Shields. Um, none of them are really for the, for the most part artists that I'm really familiar with or that I listen to or anything, but, the soundtrack as a whole really resonates with me. Like that movie, I really do love it quite a bit. Um, and I think the soundtrack kind of, it, it sort of, uh, really mirrors the sort of, uh, isolation and, um, just the profound loneliness that, uh, the two main characters are feeling. Right. And, and then when they connect there in Japan and they have their, basically their, little bit of a relationship, a human moment between the two of them, um, basically find themselves sort of in a sea of, uh, alienness really like they're essentially in an alien world. Um, so yeah, I, I think that one really works very well. Every time I, every time I hear a song from that one, I, uh, I quite like it. Um, and I, and I watch that movie over and over again, quite a bit. Really love that film. So yeah, no, um, Really nice stuff and a uh, really great score. Um, mm. Can we bring up some, some like TV shows? Because there is a TV show that I'd like to single out for how good its music is. Cool. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And that's Breaking Bad. Um, the mm. uh, composer whose name escapes me at the moment. Um, but they basically had one composer for the entire running time of the, of the series. And uh, really he went – I've listened to some interviews with him on other podcasts and things. And uh, – Really went out of his way. He did some some really kind of experimental scoring for a lot of it. He did some um, electronic style um, scoring. Uh, it's very kind of a non traditional kind of way that you would score a uh, TV show like that. You know, um, yeah. And uh, really, uh, he actually released an album of uh, a bunch of his scores or a bunch of his pieces. Uh, that you can uh, listen to. I think it's on Spotify, but you can uh, listen to it or purchase it. Um, and, I, and I feel really bad that I'm, I'm blanking on his name, and I'm intentionally not looking it up <laughs> just because I feel embarrassed about it. But um, now uh, that's absolutely worth checking out. Again, this is a movie podcast, not a TV podcast, but um, that though that that score um, is absolutely worth uh, checking out, especially if you're a fan of the show. Yeah, and then. Um... Uh, the final song there from uh, Badfinger. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, really, I thought that worked really well for that episode. Uh, 
really gave the last sort of like real emotional kick to the whole series. Yeah, no, um, the the music choices in general are really good in uh, in that show. It's it's kind of one of those where they they really um, uh, everybody was operating on on full cylinders for that one. Um, but I did want to particularly mention the score. Um, one of those things you it's it's very uh, um, there's a lot of movie music that's good that that's fine that does its job mm. um that is even moving and wonderful and that that i love but that really doesn't push the audience at all it really doesn't yeah. uh, ask the audience to do anything um new or to um you know kind of stretch what you think that the the music for a certain scene should be and um and breaking bad was one of those shows probably the the only tv show that i can really think of off the top of my head that really pushes the boundaries of what um tv scoring music can sound like so um, yeah absolutely again um go back through watch the show with that in mind you know like really listen to the music sometime it's it's worth it yeah cool all right so um I think we're pretty much ready to wrap yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure episode. we could sit and like find other great examples. The zither music from the Third Man, you know. Let's, uh, you know. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, you know. Uh, <laughs> and the Seventh Tom, Samurai, uh, you know. Seventh Samurai, yeah. Uh, what's his name? Sato or something like that. Magnificent uh, Seven. As long as we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We could, we could definitely probably go on. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll I guess we'll wrap it up here. Uh, Daniel, tell people where they can find you on the amazing World Wide Web. Well, if you liked me talking about Doctor Who now, you can uh, listen to me talk about it in a full podcast that I do with my wonderful, lovely wife, uh, and that's going to be the Oi Spaceman, a Doctor Who love story podcast. Uh, you can search for us on iTunes or Facebook, or go to our website, oispaceman.libsyn.com. That's oispaceman.libsyn.com. Um, and if you want to just kind of follow me and see what I'm doing on the internet, probably the best is just to follow me on Twitter. I'm at Daniel E. Harper. Yeah, and um, you'll be able to find all of his links uh, now on our official Podbean page. Yeah, we have an official uh, page now? We have an official page, one I paid wow. for. Wow. Uh, TMB dos.podbean.com go there you will find all of the episodes uh you can just download them right there listen to them you don't have to go to clunky old youtube and and have a video open and listen to us uh blather on that way you can listen to us as you're you know running around exercising fiddling around at work having sex with your wife whatever um this might mean i can actually listen to our podcast now yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, TMB DOS dot Podbean dot com. That's they must be destroyed on site. Uh, we have all the episodes up there, or should have them all up there uh, very shortly. And um, you can find all of our other links there. You can find my uh, Twitter. You can find Daniel's Twitter. You can find our YouTube pages on there. I don't know if Daniel wants people watching his YouTube page anymore because he doesn't really update that as much. I, if, but... you want, if you want to watch it, that's fine. I, I, you know, we're good. Yeah. Maybe I'll start uploading videos again one of these days. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So uh, go there. And um, I will end off with a piece of music. And this time around, I'm actually going to pick something not from my official list, but from my runners up. I'm actually gonna pish. Uh, I'm actually gonna pish, pish. That's not even a word. I'm gonna pick uh, "Pusher Man" from Superfly by Curtis Mayfield uh, for the ending track for this episode. So, uh, yeah, thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for uh, for being here, Daniel. Thanks for having me, as always. Yeah, and uh, we'll see you guys later. Bye bye. Cheers.
Give us some 